So we were in the middle of the book of Ezekiel. And the second half of the book of Ezekiel, more or less, is somewhat different. You know, you get past the destruction. The first half of the book is mainly about the destruction of Jerusalem and Ezekiel's attempts to justify that, to, to uh, you know, give an explanation of why God would let this happen to his city. Uh, now, in the second half of the book, the view, first of all, is directed more outwards, and then you begin to look past that to restoration. Uh, a couple of oracles in chapters 27 and 28 are quite striking poems, I think. Uh, they are directed towards the king of Tyre. Now, you may wonder why the interest in the king of Tyre, uh, but, you know, he was... I suppose, an important neighbor. But one thing that comes across in it is that there may also have been a little envy between Jerusalem and Tyre. The more striking of these poems is in chapter 28. Say to the prince of Tyre, because your heart is proud and you have said, I am a god, I sit in the seat of gods in the heart of the seas. Yet you are but a mortal and no God. Actually, that sums up a lot of prophetic preaching, uh, particularly for Ezekiel and also for Isaiah. It's that the difference between being God and being human is crucial. And nothing quite gets under their skin like somebody who rises too high. This is similar in its way uh, to Greek tragedy, to the theme of hybris. You know, in, in Greek tragedy, this is, is the, the reason some people fall, is because they try to rise above their station. They try to rise too high. And evidently, uh, Ezekiel had that sense too, with more of a theological grounding. But it's typical of the ancient world, I think. Uh, this is very typical of the opening chapters of Genesis. You know, that in the, the whole Adam and Eve story, the problem is wanting to be like God. Now, of course, in Christianity, you're supposed to want to be like God, but maybe in a different way. And the mode in which you do it would make a difference. But there really wasn't any room for wanting to be like God in uh, in the Hebrew Bible for the most part, at least not until very late in it. The other interesting thing in chapter 28, um, well, there are a couple of other things. First of all, it says, you are indeed wiser than Daniel. No secret is hidden from you. And now Daniel shows up in the Bible with a book credited to his name, and according to that book, we'll read it in due course, uh, according to that book, Daniel should have been a contemporary of Ezekiel. But here I think he very obviously is not a contemporary of Ezekiel. He's a famous ancient wise man. And in another passage in Ezekiel, he's mentioned in the same breath as Noah. Uh, you know, somebody of, of legendary status like that. Uh, now, so, I mean, that tells you where the name Daniel came from. And in fact, the, the stories about Daniel in the book of Daniel are basically fictional. Uh, late then in the, almost 100 years ago, when the texts were found at Ugarit in, in Syria, there turned out to be stories about a man named Daniel, which is probably just the same name, uh, spelt slightly differently, as a famous ancient man already in the second millennium. Uh, the, the final thing I want to mention about chapter 28 is in verses 11 and following. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, Carnelian, chrysolite, and moonstone, beryl, onyx, and jasper. 
You know, I hate it when I find words in Hebrew that when they're translated, I still don't know what they mean. <laughs> and this is generally true of precious stones and this kind of thing. Uh, but you were, on the day that you were created, they were prepared with an, an anointed cherub as your guard, and I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You were blameless in your ways until iniquity was found in you. Now, the reason that passage is interesting is, does Ezekiel know the story of the Garden of Eden? Well, he knows a story of the Garden of Eden. It doesn't seem to be quite the same one. You know, at least in Genesis, Adam never gets dressed up to this degree. Uh, you know, this seems to be a much more exalted kind of figure. And, you know, the, the uh, cherub in Genesis is brought in at the end to guard the way to the tree of life to keep Adam away from it. Whereas here, he's already a kind of personal security guard for, for this figure, whether this be Adam or not. Now, you know, one of the oddities, I don't know if you talked about this last semester, is that you know, we think of the story of Adam and Eve as one of the fundamental stories in the Bible. Uh, but it only shows up around the time of the exile. You know, <laughs> it seems to have come in late. And, uh, you know, with a lot of Mesopotamian connections at that point. So... And this story, this passage, is significant, you know, for trying to locate where that story came from because there seems, seem to have been different traditions about it in circulation, even in the time of Ezekiel. Any question on any of that? Mike? Yeah. Oh, stay tuned. <laughs> We, we'll get to it. We'll get to it in the second half of the course. Daniel is actually the book of the Bible on which I have worked most in my, my time. Um, so we, we'll come to that in due course. Now, for now, though, I want to move on to a series of oracles in Ezekiel's chapter 36 and following. Now, in chapter 36... Uh, verses 22 and following. Thus says the Lord, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. It's very typical of Ezekiel. You are not really worth anything, but God's reputation is riding on it, so he has to do something. Um, I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. And for Ezekiel, and, you know, for some of the other prophets too, I think, this was the real problem. The damage done to the reputation of God by the destruction of Jerusalem. And, but now, as in Jeremiah 31, you get a fairly radical solution here for, for restoration. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. Now, you don't really have a tradition of baptism in the Hebrew Bible, but this is the imagery from which it would develop. And you know, it's natural enough symbolism that you purify or clean something by washing it. Um, and I will clean you from all your uncleanness. And you see, for Ezekiel, uncleanness is most of the problem. He is also concerned with what we would call moral issues, but he's especially concerned with impurity, uncleanness, defilement. But then, a new heart I will give to you, and a new spirit I will put in you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. How do you get people to behave properly? Sin. 
surgery. <laughs> you know, you've got to rewire them and make them so that they have no choice about it. <laughs> now, I think, you know, this is, in a way, uh, a council of desperation. It's frustration, it's kind of a lack of confidence. And I must say, you know, it goes against the grain of the Hebrew Bible. And it, it doesn't become the norm at any point. I think, on the whole, the Hebrew Bible and the Jewish tradition after it remain very strong on free will. But in some of these passages, now it already in Ezekiel we're beginning to anticipate some of the things we'll find in books like Daniel, the apocalyptic literature later on, and it's looking for some kind of new creation, something radically different. And, you know, it, as in many revolutionary movements, down to modern times, the idea is you've got to make people behave. If you leave it trusting to their response, you're not going to get anywhere. Now, that, I think, seems to be Ezekiel's uh, sense, too. And we will see in a few minutes his prescription, then, for what, how things should be set up in the New Jerusalem after the exile. Uh, before we get to that, maybe the most famous passage in all of the book of Ezekiel is in chapter 37. <clears throat> this is, And the hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me around them, and there were very many lying in the valley, and they were all very dry. Now, it's a powerful image. It has been suggested, I don't think you can prove it one way or the other, but that uh, a possible inspiration for that is the way the Zoroastrians treated the dead, the Persians. Now, you know, Ezekiel himself probably didn't live to see the Persian conquest of Babylon. That didn't happen until 539. That was 50 years after the final destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, but the Persians were coming, and these later chapters of Ezekiel may well have been written by his disciples or by, by people. It means very much in the same kind of theology, came same kind of spirit, even the same kind of style. Uh, but they could be later. And the, the Zoroastrians, you know, famously lay out the bodies of the dead to be picked clean by vultures. Now, uh, that, you know, there's a, at least a, a striking coincidence between that and this valley full of dry bones. And he said to me, prophecy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will lay sin you on you, and I will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And in classic Ezekiel style, you shall know that I am the Lord. That's the purpose of most of what Ezekiel says, is so that you know who is God, and it's not you. Now, so I prophesied as I had been uh, commanded, and suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, you know, and one should break into song at this point, an e-bone connecting to the thigh bone and so forth. And they all stood at their feet, a vast multitude. Now, is this the resurrection of the dead? Incidentally, the resurrection of the dead is also attested in Zoroastrianism, and the Zoroastrians had it before the Israelites. There was no precedent for bodily resurrection in the Hebrew Bible down to this time. You know, the, there were ideas of immortality in ancient Egypt. There were ideas that kings perhaps live forever and could feast with the gods. There are 
you know, burial stele of kings in uh, in Phoenicia, saying may he may he feast with Baal, uh, but you have no tradition really of bodies getting up out of the grave. Now, I don't think ideas like that can ever be explained simply as borrowings, but certainly the idea can be suggested by coming in contact with another people. And you know, it's not all that prominent in Zoroastrianism, but it is attested. But then, uh, but is that what's involved here? Well, he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We're cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord, I'm going to open your graves, bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. So what is he talking about? See, he's not talking about individuals coming back to life. He's talking about the people coming back to life. So it's purely metaphorical. Actually, in uh, the, the rabbinic tradition, at one point they ask, well, then what became of all these people? And it says, well, they got up, they sang a hymn to the Lord, and then they died again. Uh, it was just a demonstration of God's ability to do it, <laughs> if you like. Now, that certainly wasn't implied in the book of Ezekiel itself, because in Ezekiel itself, it's purely metaphorical. But the idea is that after the destruction of Jerusalem, you figure that people is finished, and they're not coming back. And here he's saying it will be as if people got up out of their graves and came back. Now, this passage would be influential later on and would be reinterpreted in terms of individual resurrection. We have at least one text in the Dead Sea Scrolls that does that. Uh, but, and, you know, the, the stereotype view has been that bodily resurrection is typical of the Hebrew tradition and immortality of the soul, typical of the Greek tradition. But it's not actually that simple. Uh, the only book in the Hebrew Bible that clearly refers to resurrection of individuals indicated by the fact that after they're raised, they're judged, is the book of Daniel. And that this isn't written, and we know exactly actually when that passage in Daniel was written, it was somewhere in 164 BC, so much later. So this is a late development in the, the Hebrew Bible, and what will develop then, what you'll get in Daniel and what you also get in the earlier apocalyptic books is the resurrection of the spirit. It's the nephesh. Something, you know, often translated as soul, it's not quite the same idea, but it's the spirit of life in a person. Uh, it's the thing in the book of Samuel, uh, when Saul calls up the witch of Endor, you know, it's like a ghost come to life. So I think the spirit that was thought to live on was like a ghost. Now, in a sense, the spirit was always thought to live on, uh, but it was thought to live on in Sheol, where you'd be better off dead, so to speak. If there was just no pleasure in it. The dead in Sheol couldn't even, even uh, praise the Lord. So what's really the difference in books like Daniel when it comes into the Jewish tradition is that the dead, some people are raised up to heaven and other people are really sent to damnation. We shall return to that because the question of afterlife is a big issue in the Psalms and again later on. Any questions? Now, further premonitions of apocalypticism in chapter 38. 
Mortal, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog. Any of you familiar with Gog? <laughs> Where else does he show up in the Bible? Revelation. Good. I'm glad there were one or two Christians here, at least. <laughs> so he shows up, but in the book of Revelation, uh, it's Gog and Magog, as if there were two people. Now, if you've, any of you are doing Hebrew, you know that well, often put ma in front of a word and you get a place. It's a way of, and so Magog is just the place of Gog. Gog, as he appears here, isn't really a historical individual, but in all probability, the name came from Gyges of Lydia. Any of you familiar with Gyges of Lydia? Any of you do a little bit of classics in your youth? The famous king in, in Herodotus. Uh, but he never had anything to do with Israel or Judah. He's just a famous pagan king. And now, this is a phenomenon that you get in the later prophetic books. And uh, it's a kind of xenophobia. It's the sense that the whole world is against us. If you have a famous ancient king out there, he must be coming to get us. Now, it's not so difficult to see how that mentality arose. Because, you know, the Assyrians had come to get them. The Babylonians had come to get them. Eventually the Greeks, I mean, the Persians too. Persians generally get good press in the Bible, but there were still foreign rulers. And what you will find in a couple of these later oracles, and this is one of the classics of it, is this idea that all the foreign nations indiscriminately will come to get us and there will be a pitch battle, and God will destroy them all. All of this, by the way, is re was replayed in the Left Behind series. <laughs> Any of you ever read the Left Behind series? Yes? Any of you ever see the movie? Did you enjoy it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, um, I must say, I, I did try to read a bit of it. I didn't get very far. I couldn't quite take it. Uh, in the, but somebody, one time I was doing a class on apocalypticism downtown with Abbas Aminat, and we had a student come in who gave a talk on it, and she showed clips from the movie. And a lot of it is taken straight out of Gog and Magog. And Gog was thought to be Russia, coming from the north to, us, to uh, destroy Israel. And, you know, it says here, God will destroy their weapons out of their hands so planes fall mysteriously out of the air. Uh, <laughs> now, whether the, uh, you explain the phenomenon behind the Left Behind series as being analogous to the xenophobia of, uh, of Second Temple Judah, uh, I don't know. But it is a strange mentality. It's a mentality that thinks that the world is against us. And a mentality, I'm afraid, that is very much with us at the present time. But in the case of Gog from the land of Magog, thus says the Lord. Let's see, where did they want to pick this up? Chapter 38, verse 17. Thus says the Lord God. Are you he of whom I spoke in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who in those days prophesied for years that I would bring you up against them? What on earth could he be thinking of there? There's nothing in the Hebrew Bible that could possibly be construed as a prophecy of Gog. Now, what we will find uh, when we look at the Psalms is there are passages that, that talk about all the nations coming up against Jerusalem. These may well have been inspired by stories like the, what happened in the time of Sennacherib, when 
an Assyrian army did come up against Jerusalem. And of course, then the Babylonian army came up against Jerusalem. And this is saying, but finally, we will have the showdown and it will be done right. So uh, on that day when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord, my wrath shall be aroused. In my jealousy and in my blazing wrath, I declare, on that day there will be a great shaking of the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the animals of the field, and all creeping things and all human beings that are on the face of the earth shall quake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, cliffs shall fall, every wall will tumble. And I will summon summon the sword against Gog. And down, if you skip down to 39.17, Then speak to the birds of every kind and to all wild animals, Assemble and come, gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you, a great sacrificial feast on the mountain of Israel, where you shall eat flesh and drink blood. Remember the expression, you know? It does live on in some ways, in some traditions. Uh, Now, in this case, it's a fairly bloodthirsty tradition. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, lambs, goats, bulls, etc. You shall eat fat until you are filled, and you shall be filled at my table with horses and charioteers and warriors of all kind. Now, you may say this is a bit vengeful. Is there any, well, (laughs) before one writes off the Old Testament for its vengefulness. What you get in the book of Revelation goes farther. It's very much in the same mode. Now, again, we'll talk about this at more length maybe when we get to the Psalms. You can certainly see how feelings like this would arise. And God knows there are lots of people in the world today who entertain similar feelings about various classes of people, and some people, uh, you know, entertain them envisioning America as the mighty of the earth. This is the kind of mentality behind the Twin Towers. But you also get it the other way around. Now, it serves a psychological function, I think, no doubt about that, that people found a certain consolation in this. There may be a place for it, but you wouldn't want to encourage it, I think. You know, it's kind of a last-ditch consolation of religion, if you like. The hope of that final battle. We will see this in much greater detail when we get to the apocalyptic literature a little bit later on. Thoughts, reactions... Yes. Um, maybe I'm just remembering the Leviticus wrong, but isn't drinking blood a really bad thing in any literal sense? Yes. Uh, so Ezekiel is so concerned with purity, even though it's metaphorical here. What did that? What did, it just seems like that would be something that you have an aversion. I know. Uh, uh, but but I think you know what what it's saying is that all bets are off. You know, when you come to demolishing Gog, when you come to demolishing, like, the undefined other, all purity rules are suspended. I think. But, you know, it is rather disgusting, actually. But, but that, I think, you know, it's, and I think it's meant to shock, in a way. But it's also, you know, promising, you know, an utter vindication, an utter revenge, really. It's doing to them even more than they did to us. Just looking at a text, we talked about um, calling out all the birds and all the wild animals. Yeah. They're the ones that are eating the horse. Yeah. Well, yeah, but they get eaten. 
at, <laughs> at least. <laughs> uh, now, but now you say, okay, speak to the birds of every nation, assemble and come. Um, at the feast I am preparing, and you shall eat flesh and drink blood. So I'm not so sure that they're not saying that you will join in the feast. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty. Now, you're going to need help. That's why we bring in the birds and the air. You know, there's a limit to your power of consumption. Uh, you know, I don't know if this becomes a contest. Like the hot dog eating contest. But, uh, Andrew. Is this also kind of sneakiness is a way of catharsis? Yeah. Just to kind of get that anger totally out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, and I think, you know, the question is how far out do you have to get it before you're not going to dwell on it? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you could actually do this and actually, you know, demolish them all, you might then feel perfectly charitable after it. <laughs> but, you know, it's not likely to be realized to that degree. But I think, you know, it does speak to a psychological need. I mean, this is very much an issue with the book of Revelation in the New Testament. I mean, is this an essential ingredient of religion, something that we actually need to have there? Is it something you've got to cater to, one way or another? And I think, you know, one hopes then that you don't dwell on it, that you don't take it as a formula for everyday life. Um, but I think, you know, I think it is all fantasy. And while it stays in the realm of fantasy, maybe not so bad. Again, it's an issue, do things stay in the realm of fantasy? You know, if you're fantasizing about this kind of, of revenge, um, you know, will it not spill over? And this is, has been a huge issue, you know, with uh, millenarian groups in, the, in modern times and how far people are actually motivated by fantasy like that. I think, you know, all of the apocalyptic fantasies of vengeance, I think originally they're actually meant to support a quietist attitude, that you wait for God to do it. You're not supposed to go out and do it yourself. But you see, if you're a really pious person, you just might want to give God a hand, you know, or remind the Lord. <laughs> uh, this is sometimes condemned in the tradition as forcing the end. And I'd say, it, you know, it's, it's exceptional. It doesn't happen regularly, but it does happen. So we'll, we will come back to this once or twice later on in the course. Anybody else feel like chipping into this? Yes, Ben. Like yep. <laughs> yep. I wouldn't, you know, it's not a close connection. But, you know, the whole idea of the Eucharist really, first of all, it, it's founded on the idea of a blood sacrifice. Now, blood sacrifice is by and large something we have turned away from for the most part. But again, you know, it speaks to something visceral, I think. And the, the idea, you know, the real problematic idea in the Eucharist is the idea that God requires the sacrifice of his son. Don't try this at home. You know, there, there was a famous case in California, actually, of a man who believed God wanted him to sacrifice his daughter, and did so. And he was, because you have the story of Abraham and Isaac, too. 
But I think, you know, that's a problematic idea, but it does speak to something that's deep. You know, it gets a visual response from people. But I think, you know, the eating and drinking in the Eucharist is in a different frame of reference. I mean, you're not doing it there for vengeance. Uh, it, it's, you're doing it for participation. Okay, there's one other thing that I want to discuss in the book of Ezekiel, and this is in chapter 44. And we may have to speed up a little bit. Uh, this is, you know, in chapters 40 to 48, an angel gives Ezekiel, supposedly, or maybe it's some disciple of Ezekiel, a vision of how things should be reconstituted when they return to Jerusalem. And everything is laid out on a plan. Every tribe is given its own allotment. And um, to the prince shall belong land on both sides of the holy district. The king is called a prince, which is also what the term for the leader in the priestly source in the Pentateuch. But what you'll find in Ezekiel is the main job of the prince is to be sure that there are enough offerings for the sacrifices. In the end of the day here, the priests are going to be very much in control. Now, thus says the Lord in verse 9, uh, <clears throat> uh, no foreigner, uncircumcised in heart and flesh, of all the foreigners who are among my people Israel, shall enter my sanctuary. Now, in fairness, this would not be an extraordinary idea in the ancient world. I think many cults would have had restrictions on foreigners entering a temple but the Levites who went far from me, going astray from me after their idols, shall bear their punishment. Now, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, you see that the Levites were, by and large, the country clergy. And in the book of Deuteronomy, they shut down all sanctuaries outside of Jerusalem. And so the question comes up, what are you going to do with all these Levites? And what they say in Deuteronomy is they can go up to Jerusalem and have a share in the sacrifices. Now, this didn't play too well in all probability with the priests in Jerusalem. It just meant you would have more people in line for their piece of the, the sacrifices. It was dividing resources. Um, but so what, what uh, they say here in Ezekiel, they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having oversight of the gates of the temple. They shall slaughter the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. They shall attend on them and serve them. But I have sworn concerning them that they shall bear their punishment. They shall not come near to serve me as priest. In other words, they can come up to Jerusalem, but they're going to be second class. They can be hewers of wood and drawers of water. They can do the dirty work. And there was a lot of messy work to be done in a temple because they killed a lot of animals, they spilt a lot of blood, and th they say, oh, they can do that. They can do that kind of stuff, but that's it. The Levitical priests, the descendants of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary, when the people went astray from me, they shall come near me to minister to me. It is they who shall enter my sanctuary. It is they who shall approach my table. When they enter the gate of the inner court, they shall wear linen vestments. They shall have nothing on, of wool on them. Uh, they shall have linen turbans on their heads, linen undergarments. They shall not bide themselves with anything that causes sweat. You know, in, in the book of Leviticus, there is an aversion to bodily excretions of any sort. These cause impurity. You know, they, they like things clean and dry and separate. So then, when they go out into the outer core to the people, they shall remove the vestments in which they have been ministering and lay them in the holy chambers 
so that they may not communicate holiness to the people. Would you have thought that they should communicate holiness to the people? That that would be a good thing to do? Well, not from this perspective. You see, to be holy is, first of all, to be separate. And the idea here, I think, is if you communicate holiness to the people, if you wear your priestly vestments to the market, then it's not special anymore. You, know, you erode the difference, and people won't respect it as much. So I think what they are trying to do is to frame things off so that people will respect the holy as different and as uh, a separate. A priest shall not marry a widow or a divorced woman, but only a virgin of the stock of the house of Israel. They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, and the unclean and the clean. In a controversy, they shall act as judges, and so forth. Now, also in the temple there was a court of the women, but again, there are certain places where women do not go. This would have enormously long-lasting repercussions in Christianity, I think, and indeed in some places to the present day. I don't think this vision entirely won out in Second Temple Judaism, but it is a matter of conflict and debate. And there are different attitudes to it. This kind of attitude become, it does win out in the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, which was one strand of Judaism. Now, I don't think, as I said, that all Jews would have subscribed to it, but there is a very strong priestly tradition in the Second Temple period where the main thing is to preserve purity. And in order to preserve purity, no foreigners keep women in their place, which is a subordinate place, and above all, respect the Zadokite priests. Now, Zadokite priests, I think here, is largely an honorific title. I don't think they were distinguished, you know, it wasn't necessarily a particular genealogy. But, um, but, but this is the kind of hierarchical view that is being installed, that is being proposed. Was it a good thing? Now, I think, you know, the, if you, the, the argument for the defense would be that this is the kind of thing that enabled Judaism to survive. You know, of setting up very distinct boundaries. That, in turn, raises the question, is the survival of a tradition the most important thing? There is a downside to it, because it exalts some people over others. It says some people are more holy than others. Some people are the arbiters of what is holy. And, you know, at least in some strands of Christianity, this has also been embraced and is, is very much uh, alive and well at this point in time. So, ambivalent legacy. Any reactions to it? This is not a text you bring up if you want to argue for the ordination of women. <laughs> Why would you think that? <laughs> well, you know, again, it's, uh, certainly in the, the Catholic Church, uh, as, I, as I grew up in it, a uh, very clear division. This actually broke down a bit after Vatican II, but the older churches would have a clear communion rail, which had the function of separating the sacred from the profane. And you, know, you didn't go up inside it unless you had particular reason to do it. 
And it also has huge implications then on the role of women, for example. In this one, I think it also has huge implications for what you think of foreigners. Now, we will find, um, still in the first half of the course, in the latter part of the book of Isaiah, a very different take on all of this. And we'd come back to this passage as a counterpoint. This is not the only vision proposed in the Hebrew Bible for the, the, you know, for the New Jerusalem, which is really for the ideal religious society, if you like. But it is, it is one of them. Thoughts or reflections? Yes, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Jeremiah and Ezekiel were supposedly contemporaries in Jerusalem, and they probably were. I doubt that they would have spoken to each other, <laughs> because you know, Jeremiah also said. Uh, Oh, you say, we have the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and he practically makes fun of the idea. Now, you see, his diagnosis of the situation was that the reason you're having this disaster is you're too hung up on those things and not paying enough attention to social justice. Now, from Ezekiel's point of view, the reason you're having problems is you didn't keep yourself separate enough. You didn't preserve the right measure of holiness. So there are two you know, diametrically opposite diagnoses. Now, Ezekiel, you see, was among those taken off to Babylon. This is the kind, well, again, in, in Babylon, certainly, there were many exiles who married, Babylonians even settled in, had children, whatever. Uh, but. Also, we will find when we get to the book of Ezra, this is the strand of Judaism that comes back to Babylon. That this, for the returnees, or at least for the returnees in the time of Ezra, this is what the, the vision of Judaism that should prevail. Now again, they have a hard time getting that accepted. It's a matter of conflict. But they are really, you know, two views of religion. And you still get them. We certainly have both, I think, in the Catholic Church at the moment, and you have them in other churches too. So, you know, what you're getting here is not an easy prescription for what's the right view, but more a genealogy of why we have different views and a chance to see some of the problems with them. Okay, so we do not have class this Wednesday, so see you a week from today. And then we will do a great leap forward to Second Isaiah.